nine years after the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Ashiro Honda's Godzilla depicted a monster awakened from the depths of the ocean to wreak havoc on Japanese cities. A giant fire-breathing reptile, however, was less horrifying than what was to come. In less than a decade's time, there would be dozens of real undersea beasts capable of destroying multiple cities at a time. I'm referring, of course, to ballistic missile submarines, or boomers in U.S. Navy parlance. The most deadly of the real-life keiju prowling the oceans today are the 14 Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines, which carry upwards of half of the United States' nuclear arsenal on board. If you do the math, the Ohio-class boats may be the most destructive weapon system created by humankind. Each of the 170-meter-long vessels can carry 24 Trident II submarine-launched ballistic missiles, SLBMs, which can be fired from underwater to strike at targets more than 7,000 miles away depending on the load. As a Trident II re-enters the atmosphere at speeds of up to Mach 24, it splits into up to eight independent re-entry vehicles, each with a 100 or 475 kiloton nuclear warhead. In short, a full salvo from an Ohio-class submarine which can be launched in less than one minute could unleash up to 192 nuclear warheads to wipe 24 cities off the map. This is a nightmarish weapon of the apocalypse. The closest competitor to the Ohio-class submarine is the Russia's sole remaining Typhoon-class submarine, a larger vessel with 20 ballistic missile launch tubes. However, China, Russia, India, England and France all operate multiple ballistic missile submarines with varying missile armaments and even a few such submarines would suffice to annihilate the major cities in a developed nation. What possible excuse is there for such monstrous, nation-destroying weaponry? The logic of nuclear deterrence, while a first strike might wipe out a country's land-based missiles and nuclear bombers, it's very difficult to track a ballistic missile submarine patrolling quietly in the depths of the ocean and there's little hope of taking them all out in a first strike. Thus, ballistic missile submarines promise the unstoppable hand of nuclear retribution and should deter any sane adversary from attempting a first strike or resorting to nuclear weapons at all. At least that's the hope. As such, the Trident armed Ohio-class submarines will have succeeded in their mission if they never fire their weapons in anger. The Ohio-class boats entered service in the 1980s as a replacement for five different classes of fleet ballistic missile submarines, collectively known as the 41 for Freedom, displacing more than 18,000 tons submerged. The new boomers remain the largest submarines to serve in the U.S. Navy and the third largest ever built. With the exception of the Henry M. Jackson, each is named after a U.S. state, an honor previously reserved for large surface warships. In the event of a nuclear exchange, a boomer would likely receive its firing orders via very low-frequency radio transmission. While a submarine's missiles are not pre-targeted, like those in fixed silos, they can be assigned coordinates quite rapidly. The first eight Ohio-class boats were originally built to launch the Trident IC-4 ballistic missile and advanced version of the earlier Poseidon SLBM. However, by now all of the boomers are armed with the superior Trident IID-5 ballistic missile, which has 50% greater range and is capable of very accurate strikes, which could enable them to precisely target military installations as a first strike weapon. Ohio-class submarines also come armed with four 21-inch tubes that can launch Mark 48 torpedoes. However, these are intended primarily for self-defense of ballistic missile submarines job isn't to hunt enemy ships and submarines, but to lie as low and quiet as possible to deny adversaries any means of tracking their movements. The submarine's nuclear reactor gives it virtually unlimited underwater endurance and the ability to maintain cruising speeds of 20 knots, 23 miles per hour, while producing very little noise. While other branches of the military may be deployed in reaction to the crisis of the day, the nuclear submarines maintain a steady routine of patrols, and communicate infrequently so as to remain as stealthy as possible. Each Ohio-class submarine has two crews of 154 officers and enlisted personnel, designated Gold and Blue, who take turns departing on patrols that last an average of 70 to 90 days underwater with the longest on record being 140 days by the USS Pennsylvania. An average of a month is spent between patrols, with resupply facilitated by three large diameter supply hatches. 
Currently, nine boomers are based in Bandgar, Washington to patrol the Pacific Ocean, while five are stationed in Kings Bay, Georgia for operations in the Atlantic. The end of the Cold War, and especially the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, resulted in the downsizing of U.S. nuclear forces. However, rather than retiring some of the oldest boats as originally planned, the Navy decided to refit four of the 18 Ohio-class subs to serve as cruise missile carriers to launch conventional attacks against ground and sea targets starting with the USS Ohio. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe our channel.
I'm Major Paul Rivera and the AAV Survivability Upgrade Project Team Lead. What we have behind here is the SU itself. Uh, what I'll focus in on here is we have the force protection upgrade, which is the foundation of this actual platform. So what we've done is we've actually replaced the EEC armor and brought out buoyant ceramic armor that serves two purposes. One, to bring back that reserve buoyancy to include the same armor protection that the current uh, AAV uh, Ram RS has right now. Underneath the, you have the underneath the body of the vehicle. We've got about a two two and a quarter inch uh, ballistic armor panel that's been put up underneath it. Uh, to include also, we've gotten rid of the linear shocks and replaced it with rotary dampeners. To the rear of the vehicle, we've uh, replaced out the old legacy uh, water jets. Uh, the cover's actually closed right now, but uh, you've got in here a new water jet. Uh, it's projected to push out. Uh, more than what we currently are pushing in the water right now and that's anywhere from five to six knots with the legacy platform to be greater anywhere from seven seven knots in the water uh, transitioning inside the vehicle right now once again like i said is the survivability upgrade program is focused on force protection uh, we do that by a couple of different ways one we've got the belly armor that's on the exterior of the vehicle interior we've got a uh, aluminum armor that's been put on the inside which is uh, retained on the inside of the walls to the side side, the side parts of the walls as well to include a 360 de 360 degree spall liner. To finally focus on that upgrade for force protection, we've got uh, blast mitigating seats. These blast mitigating seats, uh, what they focus on is getting the Marine's feet off the actual uh, blast. So by doing so, we've got footrest designed to keep the Marine's feet off and sailors. Uh, to include a five-point harness, and this seat actually, in an actual event, strokes anywhere from uh, from zero to actually up to four inches of stroke. What that does is it doesn't allow the Marine to necessarily survive. It actually increases that ability to survive and be able to walk away with those lower extremity uh, injuries, so they're not uh, taking those. To include also a headrest. The seats, the unique thing about these seats is they actually serve as a secondary function. Uh, instead of just worrying about stepping up on bench seats, you also have the backs of the seats that you can actually step on and uh, maneuver on the top of the vehicle. Walking on the inside of the vehicle, you also have a new deck floor. This deck floor is actually about, uh, from the bottom of the hole up, is about eight inches. That also gets you and the occupancy away from the actual event of the blast. Uh, and then behind this engine panel right here, we've got actually a new engine and a new transmission and open that up so what we got back here is you've got a new 675 cummins engine you've got a, a new transmission made by kds and a new pto that's the heart of the vehicle and that's what's really bringing a lot of success to this platform for the due to the fact that we have about 10,000 pounds more weight uh, added to the uh, to the vehicle so and then the last shot that you probably want to take a look at is if you can look up towards the front, you're actually seeing the new driver's display. That new driver's display is basically getting us into uh, current times uh, instead of having to deal with the old system that we had that was just obsolescent and uh, obsolete.